Every so often I come across a distribution that I just have never heard of before and it makes me ask, what the f is that distro? And this has happened so often I've created a series of these videos and over the course of that series I've learned that just because I've never heard of a distribution before doesn't mean that it's automatically bad. So I've tried to learn to keep my mind open when it comes to these distributions and I think we actually have discovered a good one for today. So today I'm going to be taking a look at a distribution called Ultramarine Linux and this distribution is based on Fedora. Now there are a ton of distributions out there based on Ubuntu, Arch, Debian and those types of distros. There are just dozens of them all over the place. You can't stumble into DistroWatch and not come across at least one Debian based distro or one Arch based distro. What you can't find so many of are Fedora based distributions. There's just not a lot of them. So this one here should be pretty interesting. So what we're going to do today is we're going to load this thing up in a virtual machine and take a look at it. But before we do, we should take a look at the website because as you know, one of the best ways to judge a distribution is on its website. So a lot of the distributions I looked at in this series didn't actually have websites and usually that was a precursor to them being not so great. But that's not the case today. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Ultramarine Linux website which looks like this. So it's a very minimal website, but there is quite a bit of documentation here. They have a wiki, so if you wanted to get some documentation on the distribution, you could easily do so. And other than that, it's just a fairly simple website. It's well designed, it has all the information you should need, so you can you can come here and just download it right with the download button, which is not a given based on my experience with some of these distributions. Sometimes they hide the download button, looking at you in OS. Anyways, one of the cool things about Ultramarine Linux is that if you have Fedora installed already, you could actually translate your existing Fedora installation into an Ultramarine installation by just using this bash command. So that is actually kind of cool. It reminds me a little bit of Regolith. Regolith is a i3 based distribution, but they have a PPA that allows you to to migrate a traditional Ubuntu based distribution into Regolith itself, which is kind of cool. So this does something similar. Now let's read a little bit about what Ultramarine is. Ultramarine Linux is a Linux distribution based on Fedora. Our goal is to design an experience which satisfies the beginner with the simplicity while, com while retaining the features a power user would demand. Here's what we have to offer. Based on Fedora, it's open source and it has same defaults. So those are all th things that are probably pretty good. Other than that, there's not a lot of stuff here outside of the wiki. Now on that wiki, you'll find all the information you need to install some of the things that they tell you to do post installation, including installing the NVIDIA drivers and the codecs that you would need. Because similar to Fedora, you're probably not going to get access to any of the non-free binaries that you'd get with the non-free repositories, which you have to enable in Fedora. So you would probably have to do the exact same thing here. So we'll come back to the wiki if we need to, but let's go ahead now and install this thing. So, oh, before I do, actually, uh, we should click that download button at the beginning because there are multiple versions. So the flagship version runs the budgie desktop by default, but they also have the cute fish version, which is the one we're going to take a look at today because I haven't taken a look at cute fish in a long time. They also have a GNOME version and a Pantheon version, which is actually the elementary OS desktop environment, which is kind of cool. You don't see other distributions have the Pantheon as one of their defaults. So that's kind of neat. I almost took a look at that one, but I decided to go ahead with Cutefish because like I said, I haven't looked at Cutefish since it was like early in beta. So that's what we're gonna do today. Here we are in Vert Manager, and this is the Cutefish Display Manager. I have no clue what the password is, but we're going to try live user like so. We're going to try ultra marine like so. We're going to try user like so. And we're going to try live. All those failed. I wonder if there's no password at all. No, nope, there is a, definitely a password. Okay, well, I'm going to remake the, the live environment and not leave it here so long that it will lock me out because I'm. I wonder if they have the the password on here somewhere. Let's let's go to the wiki and find out because I'd rather really prefer not to have to recreate the virtual machine. A few moments later. Okay, I ended up having to recreate the virtual machine because I could not find the password that they used. Not a great user experience, but I'm the one that let it sit here for so long that it locked me out. So I'll blame myself. 
So let's go ahead and see if we can make this full screen now that I got the mouse back. And uh, from that, the grub menu there, you saw that it's very close to Fedora. So that it was basically the Fedora grub screen. Now, like I said, we're going to be taking a look at Qfish, and this is what the Qfish desktop looks like. So we're going to go ahead and install this before we take a look around. So let's go ahead and install the hard drive. Now, this is the Fedora installer by default. So from what I read, they are working on an, an installer that is custom to them, but they're still using this for now because that one's not ready yet. So we're just going to go ahead and go through the Anaconda installer now. Now, this is actually more similar to the... Fedora server installation instead of the workstation installation because and I say that because in the user the works the workstation installation of Fedora you don't create a user until afterwards but that's not the same in the server version of Fedora so we're going to go ahead and choose the proper hard drive which I always do that wrong it's all it's all it's already selected for you you just have to click done not the most intuitive of things but I've learned and uh, we'll go ahead and create our user now so so and like so now this adds pseudo privileges and it does require a password so that's good and then what is the advanced options here so this oh this is for uh, group membership and um, specifying a regular id okay so we'll just hit cancel out of that hit done up here and then it's it, it will ask you to press done twice if your password isn't strong enough I used a very strong password, it's good enough. So we're gonna go ahead and hit begin installation and we'll wait for this to be done and then I'll come back. Okay, now that is done and uh, you can see that it's done if I move my face here. And uh, it took about probably five minutes or so. So about the same as other distributions that you'd expect in this class. So let's go ahead and hit finish installation. It should reboot the system or it might be like Fedora in Gnome where it's gonna ask me to reboot the system on my own so we'll do that so like so I think that's actually gonna yeah reboot okay so we're gonna reboot the system get back here so this is the actual grub screen here and that's similar to the Fedora splash screen as well um, hmm that's fascinating why would the on-screen keyboard show up instead of the display manager because the display manager flashed up there for a second Let's see. Oh, there we go. All right. So this looks like SDDM. And this is definitely not the display manager we saw there at the beginning when I was locked out. So it's weird that this it's using a different display manager or maybe it's not. And that's just a specialized lock screen. Let's go ahead and enter password here. And here is Cutefish Desktop on Ultra, Ultra Marine Linux. So I have no clue what I'm doing here because I've, no, like I said, I've only used Cutefish there for a little while when it was still in beta. So we're going to be taking a true first look here today. Before we get into anything else, let's open up the terminal. And wow, that is really bright. So I saw a dark mode switch up here. Let's switch that on because that's going to make things look way better so let's go ahead and see if neofetch is installed it is not okay what what's with the delay when a command is not found that's really weird let's see that's weird okay so we're going to do sudo dnf install neofetch just because we can so and we're going to wait for dnf to install that thing which is going to take a few minutes because dnf is pretty slow but let's go ahead and take a while well, we're waiting for that take a look at the rest of the system so is this a menu up here no that's like an activities thing probably um it's just the, the title of the application actually so okay so this looks like what is this is this nautilus because it's kind of designed like nautilus i'm but i'm betting that it's not because we don't have we don't have like the about screen here anywhere like you would in nautilus so this is not nautilus it looks like it though doesn't it just a little bit all right so we gotta hit yes here there we go so clear this and then we're going to do neo fetch like so so we have its very own ascii art and it says it's ultimate linux this is running zsh as a default shell so that's kind of cool this is the cute fish desktop environment and this is the cute fish terminal and one of the things that i remember from cute fish from before is that the applications don't seem to have any settings so I don't know what this is all about. This period up here, I'm not sure what that's for or what the X is for. Oh, cause, oh you want know, to that's a, that's a tab. I bet you that's a tab. So if we ran, if we were running like a DNF, pseudo DNF 
update thing here, like this. Now it doesn't change the title of it, it still just says the period. That's odd. Uh, but if we added another tab, that's the that's a tab. It, I don't like how the close button is so big. It just makes me think I'm closing the window. You know, those are equal size. Uh, it's a little weird, but I don't think that that is the Ultramarine guy's fault. That's just a choice that the cute fish guys have made. Okay, so we'll let it do its update thing. There's no reason why it can't. Let's go ahead and take a look at the settings. So this is the cute fish settings application. I would bet that this is at least takes some design cues from the GNOME software settings because it's kind of laid out the same. Very simple. That's uh, weird. Okay, so I clicked on WLAN and then I clicked on display and then it doesn't actually... It goes, it goes to appearance just fine, but if you click on display, it goes to WLAN. Okay, weird. Okay, so you get to choose accent colors. So that's cool. We'll choose purple. Why not? Purple's good. Um, minimize animation system effects, dim wallpaper in dark theme. I don't really need that, but that's cool. Uh, let's see here. You can change fonts from here, which is a noted upgrade over GNOME. Uh, let's see here. Um, you can choose your background, so we'll see what wallpapers it comes with. It has the Fedora 36 wallpaper. But other than that, just a couple other extra ones. Not a ton here. You can also choose a solid color if you wanted to. Uh, we'll choose this one. The dock. So you can choose between a full and a centered dock. You can choose between the left, right, and bottom. For the placement of the dock, the size of the dock, and the display must always show, always hide, smart hide. That's cool. So lots of options there. I'm still not sure why the display tab doesn't work. I'm guessing that this is going to be a window ma or a virtual machine problem. Let's go ahead and see if we can change that resolution in the terminals. 1920 by 1080, not 1070, like so. Oh. Okay, so th that must mean that this is using Wayland. I wouldn't see uh, any other reason why XRender wouldn't be installed by default. I wonder how I would find out that it was if it was actually installed, if it was actually using Wayland or not. I don't actually know how would how I would know uh, other than googling it, I suppose. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the launcher here. So uh, here's another interesting thing that I have a problem problem with because I I'm all about finding the problems. These icons are really super small. Like why are, why are they so small compared to these? That's a little weird, so let's go ahead and see what version of Firefox we got going here. This should be the most recent version of Firefox, which it is. This is version 100, and uh, I apologize for the resolution problems because it doesn't seem that I can change it. Let's go ahead and uh, click help about yep, version 100.0.1, which is exactly the most recent version, I believe. And then what else do we have installed here? So we have calculator, Canjal preferences. I have no clue what that is. Input method. Only characters common to Hong Kong can be inputted by default. Um, I'm not sure what that is. It has something to do with different languages. Okay, a file manager, Firefox, firewall, input method selector, Kate, console. So a lot of the stuff is going to be based on KDE. That's the reason why it's using STDM. Uh, LibreOffice is here. Q QT5 settings. Uh, that's going to be for theming. Uh, cute applications, by the way. That is it. That is all the software you get. Two terminals, a text editor, a firewall thing, a browser, a file manager, LibreOffice, and a settings application. I don't know what BeLivit GUI is. It needs pseudo application. Okay, so BeLivit GUI is going to be a disk manager, so similar to GNOME Disks. I've never heard of that before. Like, never ever. Like, I wonder if that's custom to Cutefish or custom to Ultramarine, I don't know. It is cool how it separates out the ButterFS volumes. So that's neat. That's something that GNOME Disks doesn't do. Okay, I'm really interested to know what the other versions of Ultramarine look like because this is very, very, very bare. There's not a lot of stuff here. So if we actually, if we go ahead and close some of this stuff here and we can see free dash M. Now this isn't going to be 100% accurate because Actually, I can get a better idea. Let's go ahead and log out. Let me log out of this and so we can get an accurate version, a reading of the memory. Log out. It's taking a while. Okay. Let's go to full screen and go back into full screen. Did that help? No. 
Interesting. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we'll force off and we'll start up, start it up again. That was really weird. Definitely not that. And then the keyboard came up again. That almost is certainly a virtual box problem because I've never seen that before. Not virtual box, but a virtual machine problem. Let's see if there's an Xwork version of this that there's not. So either it is using Xwork and Xrender is not installed or it's using, Wa hmm, using Wayland and I just don't know it. Um, again, I'm not sure how I would figure that out. I'm sure there's a way. So let's go ahead and then run that command here like so. This is using 656. I'm glad I restarted because it was using 1100 before. So that means there was stuff running in the background. So 656 megs out of the box, uh, uh, completely idle. Nothing has been run yet. That's not bad for what it is. You know, I've, I've, there's obviously ones that have been using way less than that, but it's not GNOME, so it's not using a gigabyte out of the box. So that's good. Let's see uname dash a. So it's using kernel 5.17, which is that might be the absolute most recent one actually. This is pretty bare. Now, I don't know if it's bare because it is cute fish or if it's bare because that's the way Ultima Marine likes it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly off camera install the flagship version, which is Budgie. I'm going to take a look at it. We'll take or we'll take a look at that once I get it installed and see if it has some differences. A few moments later. Okay, here we are with the Budgie edition, which is their flagship edition. This is using LightDM as their display manager, so I'll enter the password. The installation was almost exactly the same as it was with the Cutefish version. The only thing I will say is that when I rebooted, it took about four minutes to reboot, which I don't know why. It had one of those weird timers that went down you that you see sometimes in Linux that says uh, a job is trying to complete it has two minutes to do so or something like that it was really weird so it did, I'm assuming again that that's going to be a virtual machine problem so this is the budgie desktop let's go ahead and see if there are any differences here so first let's open up a terminal so the, the control T does not open up a terminal which is disappointing but what we'll do here is do x render dash s 1920 by 1080 because I'm pretty sure, in fact, positive that this is x that this is Xorg. But x is still not here. sudo dnf install x -rander. Okay, now that that's installed, that took a good minute and a half or so. Dash s 1920 by 1080, like so. There we go. Yeah, this is Xorg. I'm wondering if Cutefish was Xorg 2 and x just was not installed. That is very odd, because x is on... Uh, I was positive that xrender was a like a dependency for xorg that it was automatically installed any time you installed x server or whatever it is but maybe i was wrong apparently i am wrong because it wasn't installed by default here it doesn't matter but it's still a little weird okay so so let's go ahead and take a look at the applications that are installed here so there's definitely more here than there was in the cute fish version so i'm wondering if i either missed something in the cute fish version let me move my face now that i see that i'm in the wrong place Let's go ahead and just remove my face completely. Uh, let's see here. So accessories, we have connections files, which is going to be, this is Nautilus right here. That's for sure. I know that. So if we go here to about files, yeah, files 42.1.1. Yep, that's Nautilus. Okay, so this is going to be used a lot of the GNOME software stuff. So we got gedit, GNOME, GNOME clocks, maps, uh, quick care control, wall Wall Street control? What the hell is that? One wall... Okay, so I think that that's going to be a wallpaper switcher. I'm guessing that that's what that is. Uh, when I saw Wall Street, though, I assumed stocks. Because, <laughs> of course, they did. Uh, anyways, weather, which is GNOME weather. Uh, window shuff shuffer? shuffler control? Settings control applications for window shuffler. What is that? I don't know what that is either. It looks like it might be a, like a tiling tool. Huh? Oh, for like... Huh. Weird. I don't know what that is. Okay, so there's some stuff here that I don't I don't recognize at all. So go education, we've got LibreOffice Math, Graphics, comes with Draw and Photos. There's no GIMP here installed, so you have to install that. Firefox is for internet. Again, there's not a lot of stuff here, so you're not going to consider this an, a bloated application or a bloated distro by any means. LibreOffice and Calendar here. Other Firewall, LightDM, GTK, Reading Settings. And a previews control, sound and video, we got cheese, sound recorder, and videos. That's probably going to be GNOME videos. Yep, that's GNOME videos. I always get that confused because if you, you look here, the color there reminds me a lot of the MPV icon. But it's GNOME videos. 
Uh, we got the Blivet GUI, which is that uh, disk manager thing that we saw before. HTOP is installed by default, Budgie desktop settings, software, utilities, which is going to be most of the Budgie settings. Weird, it also comes with GNOME disks installed as well. So, okay, so let's go ahead and uh, open up a terminal. We'll do free dash M again, like so, using 1129, but we opened up a couple things, so that's probably going to be less than that. Let's see here, what else? Let's go ahead and look at those settings. So, budgie desktop settings. So, this is going to be somewhat similar to GNOME Tweaks, if I remember right. So, you're going to be able to change the widgets and the icons and the theme and a lot of settings to do with the desktop and windows themselves where the panel is and so on and so forth that's really cool i don't know why they call the theme widgets it's really weird but they i think they've always done that so if we change to a different uh, theme so they come looks like they have two different themes here this one here that's basically adueta this one's basically the same and uh yeah so a couple of different things that it comes with and you can choose between different icons, which it has um, just that one icon pack. OK, so not a lot of selection, but you could easily install stuff easily enough using putting it in the, the proper directory or whatever in order to do that. So you could there's a lot of customization here that you can get with this, which you wouldn't be able to get with GNOME. Uh, this is the Raven menu, which is what the Raven menu has always been, where you'd see some widgets and then your notifications. And then what else? So if we open up HTOP, let's go ahead and see what we got going here. So budget it seems to be taking up the majority of the CPU usage. 161 tasks, 333 threads, which is a little high, to be honest with you. Especially considering that it doesn't appear that there's much here that we've opened up that is actually running. I don't see anything that I've opened up here that is actually running other than HTOP itself. Um, but that's okay. I mean, it's not the most, it's not the most, it's not the worst. And you got to remember, this is using a lot of the GTK stacks. So that's the reason why it's going to take up more of your resources. So uh, that is the budgie desktop and it does come with more applications than the cute fish version that's for sure and the budgie desktop is going to be more complete because as far as i know and i'm just assuming here the cute fish desktop is still in its very early development that's the reason why there was so many of those problems like a lot of the set the applications don't have their own settings panel those icons are really small things like that stuff like that is probably still going to be fixed in the future so i don't want to be i don't want to judge too hard so Here's the question. Now that we've looked at two different versions of Ultramarine Linux, what's the point? I think as I use Linux more and I've used Linux longer, I'm always searching for a reason for something to exist. So just being created by a person that is interested in making their own distro doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to exist. It's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I'm looking for something that it does, you know, different, right? And I'm not sure that there's anything here that it does different. Now, there is a possibility that I missed something because I only looked at this for 20 minutes or so. And, you know, it's a good chance that I did miss something. But from my brief view of this, it doesn't look like there's anything here that you couldn't get with just installing Fedora. What does Ultramarine offer that is different than Fedora other than it being based on Fedora, but not Fedora. And that's the question that I don't know. Uh, one of the things that I didn't check is, is Flatpak installed by default? So I'm assuming that Flatpak is like so. So if we run Flatpak list here, we get nothing. We don't get an error though. So Flatpak install, let's just say OBS. Yep, Flatpak is here. So we don't actually need to install that. So Flatpak is here and it looks like FlatHub is already installed. One of the things that I didn't see here, okay, and maybe I missed it, oh, yep, right here. I did miss it. So this is the GNOME Software Center. I'm glad that's here, because the one thing that I didn't see in the Cutefish version was a GUI Software Center. Now, again, I might have missed it, but I don't explicitly remember seeing it. Also, as slow as that is, that reminds me of a Snap. Snap's not installed by default, is it? Nope, good. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, as slow as that was, I wanted to make sure that that was definitely not a snap, which it's not. Okay, good. So Flatpak is installed just like it is in Fedora. So that's, again, not a differentiator. So uh, if, if snap had been installed, that would have at least been something that is different than Fedora, right? But it's not. It still uses the same Fedora Flatpak integration that Fedora has, right? Now, one thing that is definitely different is that from what I saw, RPM 
repositories are enabled by default. So that's something that you have to do on Fedora if you want to do that. You have to do it yourself. Here, they're automatically installed, or at least it was on the Budgie Edition. I don't remember seeing it in the Cute Fish Edition, but I wasn't really paying attention during the update. I was doing other things, right? I was messing around with the desktop environment. So that is one differentiator, but the given that the fact that enabling those third-party repositories is just the swipe of a, of a of a lever or whatever during the initial setup of Fedora, I don't think that that's a really big selling point. So I'm, like I said, I'm not sure. Like there's nothing wrong with this distro. Don't get me wrong. I sometimes come across as like super negative about these distributions and some of them for good reason, but there's nothing wrong with this distribution. I just don't know what the purpose of it is, why it is different than Fedora other than just having a different name. So that is it for this video. If you are interested in looking at Ultramarine Linux or using it, you can leave those comments in the comment section below. You can follow me on Twitter at the LinuxCast. If you're interested in following me on Mastodon, you can find that link in the video description along with all of my other social media stuff, store the store and stuff like that as well. You can also support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. I'd like to thank my current patrons, Robert Sid, Devon Patrick, Fred Kramer, TriDevil, Antoine, Meglin, Jack Sniper, Tools, Steve A, Subgear, Linux, Garrick, Samuel, KB, TGB, Keith, Andy, Uncle Bonehead, Gary, Ross, Mitchell, J Doug, Carbon Data, Jeremy Sean, Odin, Marnie, Eduardo, Eduardo Arch Center, Elliot, Mislov, Merrick, Camp, Joshua Lee, Peter A, Crucible, Dark Finance, Six Primus, PM, Arlock One, and Philip. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.